It's been fun so far. Praying for this service. Like, Lord, bless the service. Is it read a blessing in? Such good, awesome encouragement. As we get it out, just um, as if you give your offering, just turn to your Bibles, Luke chapter 15. We're going to park there for a little bit. Let's just get used to that. I ain't going to carry you nowhere else. I promise. You know, in the past, I promise. Uh, especially when he's preaching. Off, off of preaching, the problem is golden. When he's preaching, you don't know what will happen. But um, we give God thanks for the preaching of his, for his word. So I'm going to read um, Luke chapter 15. And um, yeah, Luke chapter 15. It is a story that you guys are so familiar with. Um, many Bibles in verse, I would say verse 11 onward to the end of the chapter would say, this is the story of the prodigal son. And, um, and you might be familiar with it, but I just felt like it needed to be told because I believe that the story isn't so much about the son, but it's about the father. I believe so much, it's so much about just the heart of our Heavenly Father that we're going to learn some truths out of it. So Luke 5, um, 11 to 32 is our mean um, scripture today. But before we start, I just want to just read verses 1 to 3 just to tell you what this whole parable of Jesus with the coins in the lamb is about. So it says, many dishonest tax collectors and other notorious sinners, this is verse 1, often gathered around to listen as you just taught the people. So who are there? Dishonest tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Mine is awesome. Jesus knows how to draw a crowd. This raised concerns with the Jewish religious leaders. Who, who it raised concern with? The religious people. Anytime sinners are around, and anytime notorious sinners are around, and anytime dishonest people are around, gathering to hear the word of the Lord, people are dumbfounded like, what? What's going on? This raised concern with the Jewish religious, religious leaders and experts of the law. Indignant, they grumbled and complained, saying, Normally the fruit of a religious spirit is grumbling and complaining. Not always, but part of it is the grumbling and complaining. They grumbling and complain, saying, Look at how this man associates with all these notorious sinners and welcomes them all to come to him. Now we would read the, in other gospels, it would say that it's not the... It's not the healed people who need a doctor, but it's the sick. There's something about Jesus that the religious people thought they had it. They thought that they knew God. They thought that they knew the prophets and knew the, knew, knew the law. So they don't need the revelation of the Son and right relationship with, with the Father. They didn't need Jesus, but the sick people, the dishonest tax collectors, and the notorious sinners needed Him. And, and when you position your heart to receive from Jesus, you're going to always get what you position your heart to receive. But if you feel that there's, I read God everything, you're not going to receive anything from Him. So His story is responding to this negative perspective of His relationship with sinners from the, ta from, from the notorious religious people. All right? So just to give you a summary, he talks about the lost lamb. Some of you guys know about that story, that he leaves the 99 and, and goes for the one. There was one sheep that got lost. I don't know about you, but I watched Pets the other day. And there's a very funny part with the little sheep. Go watch it. Call your son. <laughs> he got came on a pay He could take you on a date now, Chelsea. Um, but in pet, it's like, bah, it is going in the next direction. Like, wow, these sheep. The Bible says we're all like sheep and have went astray. We need a shepherd so bad. So this sheep goes away, and the man does something that is not, not known of, agriculturally speaking, because your sheep is your money. So he leaves night and nine uh, of his fold and goes search for the one. Talking back to what you said earlier, Chelsea, just the incredible value that God puts in us. The next one is a parable about the lost coin. Now this woman, the Bible says, had 10 coins. I believe that's what she said, I just highlighted. She had 10 coins and the coin got lost in her house. Now yesterday I couldn't find my phone and it wasn't a big deal, but I was searching for it, getting ready, brushing my teeth, everything, look at my phone. And this is 10 silver coins, and one of them got lost, and I'm pretty sure the value of the silver coin was way more than my phone. And the Bible talks about when she found it, she looked up everywhere, she moved furniture, she, she looked everywhere, and she finally found it. She called her neighbors and she celebrated that the coin that she lost is now here. And it's in the backdrop of this conversation about the lamb, and about the coin. What are the two things that are most precious to us, right? Relationship and our money. 
So he's going to talk about money and relationship in the story of the prodigal son, but he doesn't want to talk about uh, money first. The lamb represents money, represents people, but it's also represents money. The coin obviously is money. And we celebrate when God is redeeming things. Now remember, now the Bible says God came to save that which was lost. People lost, issues are lost, wisdom lost. What did Jesus Christ come to do? To receive and to bring back what, which, what was lost. So God is always in finding things, restoring, reconciling, and redeeming. So let's talk about this story now in verse 11. And I'm just going to highlight some of the stuff as I go through the verse with you. So um, let me read verse 11 to 13. So then Jesus said, so he told the story of the coin, and then he said this. Then Jesus said, once there was a father with two sons. So we know when you read the Bible, it gives you the characters. Who's in the Bible? Who are they talking about? A father? How many sons he had? Two. Thank you, Jesus. You're a good storyteller. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate, inheritance, that belongs to me? So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. So one son came, two sons got their inheritance, okay? Shortly afterward, the younger son packed up all his belongings and traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. Sort of like what God was redeeming Uncle Richard from a couple minutes ago. He shared his story. A child requesting for their share of an inheritance in this setting while their father or parent is alive in this culture, what they're saying is, Dad, I wish you were dead. How can you receive an inheritance of somebody alive? The full inheritance, you can't receive it. The person has to die. And the person has a lawyer, and they put it in their will, and a trustee, all that good stuff. But the person actually passed away in order to receive the inheritance, right? So notice there are two sons. And even though I said this before, the younger son requested the inheritance, both of them received what was due to them. So you have one son about to jump ship and leave the place of protection, provision, and blessing. And you have one son that stayed. We're going to hear about the son that stayed in the next, uh, next couple of minutes. There are also two, so we can learn from each different perspective. I love this story because it's not just one perspective. It's the son that went and the son that stayed and the father that loved both of them that are in the story. Once inheritance was received, he went far away. It's a faraway land, sort of like a, a Disney movie, you know. He ran away from everything that was familiar to him so he can do as he pleased, living a life of extravagance and reckless living. I don't know about you, but when I sin, I sin far away. I'm just saying, when I was in the world, I was sinning far away. When I was reckless with my life, I didn't want to sin close to home because too much people know me. I don't know about you. But enough flights that go other places because too much people know you right here. Let me tell you something. You can't hide from God. So I had to give up all those foolish thoughts and all those foolish living and come right in the corner of God's heart for me. Say, you know what? I'm not running anymore. I need help. I need healing. I need freedom. I need a new life. I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever I was ever up to no good, I said it before, I was far away by a ticket in bumps. Right? Let's read verse 14 to 16. With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry, for there was a severe famine in that land. Which land? The land that he went to. Wasn't a famine before when he had money. Wasn't a famine before, but when your resources dry up, every place you go is a famine. When you leave the perfect will of God, even though you got a little bank account that flourishing for a little bit, a little friendship that flourishing a little bit, if you're not rooted and established in God, sooner or later, a famine could come. All right? So he goes on and he says, a famine came to the land, the land that he went to. It wasn't famine before, but the famine now. So he begged the farmer in the country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent out him to feed the pigs. Now this is really weird now. This is a Jewish man feeding something that he rebukes that he's not supposed to touch you know in Acts chapter 10 read the account of Peter Peter I love Peter Peter because Peter was saved I know I'm gonna finish the finish line Peter is an awesome man if you if you need this grace to move forward Peter says to Jesus he gets this vision and God releases a rope or releases a, 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 um, a carpet from heaven and he shows them all these animals that are detestable and Jewish people shouldn't eat and he says cut and eat and feast now look God 
You telling me to cut and eat and feast things that I was told not to eat because of the judicial laws, because of the Jewish laws over this um, circumstances of the ceremony and stuff like that. It's like, yes, why are you calling things unclean that God has made clean? What he was telling him is that the Gentiles were coming into the kingdom of God. Um, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, you see Jesus, um, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, preach the gospel. They came into the kingdom. It changes how Peter looked on unclean people. It changed how Peter looked at people who didn't recognize God the way he saw God through his Jewish lens. But in these circumstances, this young man was doing something that his father wouldn't let him do because he's a Jew. It's a funny thing what you do when you're in desperate circumstances and situations. You find yourself thinking and manifesting and displaying and acting on things that seven months ago when you were not in a famine, you wouldn't even think about it. <laughs> but look at this prince, because he's a prince. Going to a place, wasting his money, debit card at zero, overdraft, the bank calling him, he got moved out, hotel got gun charge, charge for damages, because he messed up the place in his extravagant living, got fired a little gas station drop, and then the gas station said, you can't pump gas, you got to clean the septic tank. This is a prince. Sends him out with the pigs. The son was so famished, which means he was hungry, he was willing to even slop, would eat the slop given to the pigs. So not only is he feeding the pigs, serving the pigs, but he's eating the stuff. And I don't know about you, but I watch um, Charlotte's Web and pigs could, <laughs> pigs could eat some foolish things, you know? And Mr. Borden got pigs and cows and, and they're not the sweetest smelling things, even if they're clean compared to the best pig circumstances, right? I don't know how they do it. Could it be a farmer, Jesus? Thank you for the 21st century um, financial and um, mental ability to create wealth. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could last this pig and cattle thing. I don't know, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway, but but this guy was farming, you know, eating with the pigs. Wastefulness never brings a reward or harvest. Think about this, guys. Wastefulness never brings a reward or harvest. Only sowing does. Notice the man got an inheritance. He didn't sow anything from that inheritance. He didn't multiply anything from that inheritance. He wasted the inheritance on reckless living. In fact, if you look at the notes in your Bible, he wasted on prostitutes. That's the best way to put it. In a good time. Sowing only does, only, only sowing brings forth fruit. The young man had all he needed to prosper tangibly, but he didn't have the maturity or inner working to steward the blessing of his inheritance. Listen, it's, it, it, it's a rough prayer to say, God, give it to me now. It's a rough prayer to pray that. Because God gives us a grace and time to grow into the person to steward the blessing that he has for us. Now, this is what Bill Johnson says. You see, gifts are free, but maturity is expensive. Gift free. The gift that his father gave him was free. But his maturity is expensive. Maturity takes a little while. Could take a couple of years, could take a couple of months. But obedience brings the acceleration to maturity. And so Bill Johnson said, listen, the gifts are free, but the maturity is expensive. You see, a blessing in the wrong season can potentially bring about sorrow instead of joy. A blessing in the wrong season, if you don't have the maturity, no, I'm not talking about like a season like January, February. No, I'm talking about in your life. Season shift when you shift. Circumstances change when you change. When you sing a new song, you, you get a new season. And so this young man sang a new song. I want it now. I want, you know that song commercial? It's my money and I want it now. <laughs> called JJ Network, whatever they're called, right? Florida. And he wanted his money, he wanted now, and he disrespected his father, and he got what was intended to bless him, but the maturity wasn't there, and so it actually brought sorrow instead of joy in his life. Because one can lack maturity to receive and steward the weightiness of the blessing. Blessings have weight, guys. 
When you are blessed, man or woman, there's a weightiness to your words. There's a weightiness to your presence. There's an impact that you have. The greatest impact you have, it, it, the greatest challenges you can bring to other people. The more influence you have, the more impact negative you can bring to people. So God has always given us time to grow into our influence because when we get positioned to make a positive impact, He wants it to last and bring life. But this young man said, God, give, Father, give me my thing now. And he wasn't mature. In my own life, I have learned this from receiving from the standpoint as well as the blesser standpoint. Maturity is the key to acceleration. If I go mature, if I can just grow up and say, you know what, I'm not going to fight that battle that way anymore. I'm going to surrender this because that champion never lost a battle. I may lost a battle, but that champion never lost a battle. God, my boss doesn't see it my way. My wife doesn't see it my way. My friends doesn't see it my way. And he's like, Felix, the chances are not everybody going to see it your way. What are you going to do about it? I love. You gotta be humble, you gotta be quick to forgive, you gotta pray, you gotta do what's honorable and what is right, not necessarily in the sight of those that are in front of you, in the sight of the one who created you. The young man was depleted inwardly, and because of his depletion inwardly, it manifests outwardly. The blessed thing you, the most blessed thing you could have in life is a prosperous soul. 3 John verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper and be in health, and may you prosper in everything as much as your soul prosper. So my prosperity is only going to extend to the extent that my soul prospers. That's what happened to this young man. His soul wasn't prospering. And because his soul wasn't prospering, he wanted something externally to bring about prosperity. So Father, give me what is mine and let me show you how to work what is mine. Let me show you how to multiply. But the maturity wasn't there and the soul wasn't there. The health in his soul wasn't there to walk out the blessing that he received. Let's read verse 17 to 19. Humiliated, the son finally realized that he was what he was doing, and he thought, There are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I want to go back to my father's house and I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against some, some verses says, Heaven and you against you. I'll never be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. Some verses says, some translation says, slave. Now hear me out, guys. Toodles to this father. Because God, sometimes we protect our children from the journey that God won't carry them on. And we protect people too. Release people and let them learn sometime. I love what, what Richard said. You're not going to be a perfect father or a perfect mother, but you could be a praying one. And you're going to see the position of the father that he never stopped thinking about his son. In fact, he had more reserve for his son. You're going to see that shortly. But he had to release his son. And as I grow up and I hear my daughters and I hear my son, and I'm learning that sometimes they don't see from my perspective all the time. I got still got, I still got love them. I still got to encourage them. And in the background, I'm praying, I'm warned for their mind, I'm warned for their heart. I'm saying, God, I pray that they see themselves as, as you see them. And I pray that I can reflect the love that you call me to reflect from them. And until their father, they can't listen to me and they don't understand me because they're going to be seasoned when I'm not going to be there at time. As much as I want to be there, put people in their path that carry my heart for them. So that when Nikolai doing something, he need a little encouragement to come back in line. There's a Richard there. There's a Morris there riding his bicycle. Hey, Nikolai, where are you going? Oh, I'm going back home. <laughs> uh, maybe the Soleil, maybe there's conversations with a young lady and ladies explore different things. Maybe there's a woman of God somewhere that sees her and is like, you know what, young lady, I know your father, I know that. And because she shares the history of the home, the history of the father, it brings the children back in line. Because the Bible says that the goodness of God brings us to repentance. When we speak about the goodness of our father, the goodness of how he cares, the goodness of the home, like what he said, he said, I remember my father. That was the goodness. I remember my father that even in his house, even the slaves got back room that better than where I'm sleeping right now. Ooh. The Bible says, he turned his way home. Many times our need, our source of direction, our provision and peace during challenging times in different places and different seasons brings us to a point of reflection. You see, the Father wants you to reflect. The Father wants you to, all right, son, I love you, and I love you so much that I release you because you cannot be a robot and follow God. There's grace and there's love there. He gives us our free will. The young man looked around and saw everything reflecting the other opposite of what he's used to. 
He looked around, he's like, slop there, slop there, famine there, this one tired, this one hungry, I am hungry. I never experienced this out here in the world before. In my father's house, but Jesus Christ said there's many mansions. If it wasn't so, I won't tell you about this. There's many provision in the father's house, and that brought him back home. One of the things that we can so easily do is disconnect our value, our worth, our position in our father's eyes. That's something so easy we do real quick. We get a little challenge and we feel like God don't love us anymore. God don't care about us. But I'm telling you, listen, when somebody has a right relationship with you, they don't have to shout, they could whisper. And our father sometimes whispers to get our attention. Notice he already had a conversation with himself. Some of the greatest breakthrough you're going to have is talking to yourself. In fact, my friend Steve Bachman, he wrote a book. He said, you, are in, you must be foolish if you don't talk to yourself. Something like that. Right? And I'm saying to myself, some of the greatest breakthrough, and you talk to myself? I literally talk to myself, right though. <laughs> and if you never talk to yourself because this inward conversation with you and the Father, you and the Holy Spirit, it's like, oh, I could do that, I could do this. And all of a sudden, somebody walking in the room, what are you doing? Uh, just, just, just figuring out life. That's why I love running, because, especially now, because I'm unfit. I went running the other day, I went running yesterday, and Nikolai rode the bicycle, and he was like, Daddy, how much Rockies they were? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe like six or seven. Well, you're going to start on the next one. I'm like, thank you, son. But this is one mile and a half, and I bust. I could have done five miles. Da -da -da. I could have done that. No, I can't. I got to wait and come again. The greatest thing about exercise, it makes you focus. It pulls all that garbage out, and there's a space in your mind and your heart that there's something that you really need to talk about with God or something. Go and exercise, and you'll see that focus, and God begins to give you downloads when you exercise. That's one of the greatest things. Jesus walked at least five miles a day. They were like, hmm, that Jesus. No, I'm just saying, there's something about exerting yourself with energy that brings forth like a focus in your mind. We need that. We need that focus. It was a good four to five minutes, I think, with an iPhone. That was awesome. And then I hooked to it when I came back. So I need freedom from that. But guys, listen, we need to refocus. Verse 20 to 21, this is what it says. Follow me, 10, 10 verses left. It says, so the young man or the young son set off for home. What happened? He reflected. He realized he wasn't supposed to be where he at. He realized that the Father got a better place for him. And that's what God wants us to realize about him too. And he set his eyes towards home. He set for home. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming dressed as a beggar. Now this baffled me. The man not see his son in whatever time, for him in a long time. And his son is not the same son, clothes-wise, presentation-wise, that when he sent his son with an inheritance. Now he says that he see his son from afar off, dressed like a beggar, and he aware. Boy, God know me. God know you. And your best day and your worst day, he could sniff us out like a hound. He says his father saw him coming dressed as a beggar, and great compassion swelled up in his father. Now I don't know about you, but if you waste my inheritance, <laughs> and you don't have nothing to show for it, I don't know if this is going to automatically be my response, guys. I'm running for you? God, get me there. That's what grace is for. But this man, this man swelled up with great compassion for his son who was returning home. Let's take a pin. Why was he swelled up in compassion? His son was returning home. He didn't stop praying for his son. He didn't stop thinking about his son. He didn't stop sitting on that porch waiting that there's a possibility today that one day he's going to come through before he get the village gate and I'm going to see him and I'm going to run to him. He's already made up his mind. God's already made up his mind about you that if you step five feet, one inch, one centimeter in the direction that he wants you to be, which is home, which is in perfect peace, in perfect relationship with him, he's ready to run towards you. The Bible says that his hand is not short, that he cannot save. That means that God could actually reach into any circumstances and capture me. David says it like this, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Ooh. I don't try to make my bed in hell, but let's be honest, sometimes we get ourselves in hell. We didn't start out in hell. Sometimes a beautiful conversation, and boop, hell. <laughs> like, where were you? And God is saying, even on the greatest struggle of your day, I can reach you. I can touch you. I can deliver you. And it goes on and it says, so the father raced out to meet him. 
He swept him up into his arms and hugged him dearly and kissed him over and over with tender love. Now my wife and my son is teaching me that hugs heals. Getting there, guys. 30% there. Still working on it. But I, I'm still, I don't understand how that, how could this bring a breakthrough? But I'm learning. And this father knew it. But this son was in some rough, you can see he looked rough. He smells stink. I don't know about you. Homeless people are not the best smelling people in the world. And, and the father runs to his son, hugs his son, kisses his son, embraces his son, touches his son. God is personal, guys. And there's certain things that cannot be communicated in words other than a touch. She's teaching me, guys. She's teaching me. She's teaching me that sometimes Felix just shut up, just hug me. I'm okay, baby. I'll try. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, it works. I just think so. Richard, I got a tough head. You got to pray for me. I don't always just jump and hug. I want to declare. I want to decree. I want to write. And she's like, hug me. I'm like, all right, okay. <laughs> there is one day in your courts. <laughs> Guys, whatever your wife or spouse need, trust them that they need it. Trust them. When people, when people say to you, I just need encouragement, encourage them. You know? You, give, you know, we, we can't be vulnerable. This is just a little tip. We can't be vulnerable with everybody. And I'm telling you, I learned from mistakes. I've took off my shirt, jumped in the pool, showed all my tattoos, and the people still stayed there. But now I'm exposed. God wants us to take off our little slippers, show a little corn on our toes. And if you could still be my friend with my corn, then I'll take off the next slipper. You know what I'm saying, Chelsea? And then after that, we could sit by the pool, I could put one foot in, you put one foot in. But sometimes when we become too vulnerable, people too quick, People use our vulnerability against us. And we, and we gotta learn that, guys. That not everybody is meant to bless us. Not every relationship is meant to bless us. Not every friendship is out to bless us. We do have an accuser that is looking for an opportunity time at times to imprison us to old ways and old thinking. But well, we just gotta be wise. So this man knows that he had to run to his son. I thought to myself, well, don't, to be honest with you, rich people don't run unless you're using both. In this culture here, in fact, the chubber you are, thank the Lord, I'll probably be medium, you know, higher middle class maybe. The chubber you are, the more presentation of wealth they saw. And I began to do some research, and in the first century, a Middle Eastern man never ran. And I'd be like, why he never run? If he were to run, he would have to hitch up his tunic, put his garments and pull it up. And, and the man not going to disgrace himself like that. So he would not trip because he can't run in a skirt like that. If he did this, it would show his bare legs. And there's something about the custom that you cannot, the rich man can't show his bare legs. In this culture, in this Palestinian or uh, Israeli Jewish culture, first century culture, this is the Middle Eastern culture. In that culture, it was humiliating and shameful for a man to show his bare legs. Wow. And his father chose to run, but it gets better. So here's the question. If it was shameful for a man to run in that culture, why did the father run when his son returned home? Now, I don't know about you, but picture me. That I don't know if you ever had a quarrel with your son or your daughter. You, you kind of unhealthy sometimes, blue or fight. They had to come to you to, you know, I was wrong, daddy. You kind of feel it. Because, and that, that's a wrong perspective. That's in our flesh. That's really wrong. Because if a daughter or a son really want to connect with you and they're being vulnerable, honor that vulnerability and meet them 90% the way. Trust me when I tell you. I'm learning that. So what motivated him to, um, to shame himself? So here's the son coming back with shame, but what motivated the father to shame himself? Before we answer the question, we have to understand an important first century Jewish custom. There was a custom when people leave a village that dishonored their family, that dishonored the village, that dishonored that community. When they walked out disgracefully and they want to return, there was a custom that for could ever negatively change their life. A guy by the name of Kenneth Bailey, an author of The Cross and the Prodigal, explains that if a Jewish son lost his inheritance among the Gentiles, where was this guy? He was with the pigs. He wasn't with the people that know his ways, that know his custom, that know their God. He was in a mess. So he was with the Gentiles and then return home. The community would perform a ceremony called the Kaza. Let me tell you about the ceremony. They would break a large pot in front of him and yell, you are now cut off from your people. The community would totally reject him. So here's his son asking his father for the inheritance. 
wasting the inheritance on reckless living. And this father knows this custom. And you know what? Normally research shows that it would be the mother that would go out. You know, mother's there, you know, busy. But this time around, it was the father. Because if the mother go, you could still get the casa. You could still get the pot. Because in that arena, they didn't honor the women the way that women are supposed to be honored. In fact, Jesus is the first one for the woman liberation rights. He honored women like no other prophet, no other leader did. So he, 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 he jumps in so these people can't bust the pot. He runs out to his son from afar off. Remember, he was a beggar. Remember, he's coming from afar. He runs out and he picks up his son. And you, he's saying to himself, you try shame him today. You try shame my son today because I'm shaming myself in front of my son because I want my son back in my house. Then the son said, Father, I love it. Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me, and the father interrupts. You see, some of us, and I could do myself, when I look at the mess, and I should do better, you could ask my wife, I have a hard time sometimes accepting the grace of God when I feel hard. And sometimes you don't need anybody to be hard on you, you're hard on yourself. And in this moment, the son is saying, I, I don't want a promotion. I don't want a position that I used to have as a son. Just let me. And the father interrupts. And the father interrupts and says, Son, guess what? You're home now. Shut up. Let me take care of you. Let me restore you. Let me redeem you. Let me get you back on track. Turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the biggest robe. <laughs> My very own robe. Bring me the biggest robe, bring me my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulder. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. And bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Bring out some Air Jordans, 13s. Them little sabatos that he got on, they don't look too righteous. He said, if he's going to wear the best, guess what? The best in this village is my robe. Give him my robe. And guess what? The seal of the ring of sonship. That was the seal that your father would give you. That was a ring that bared the crest of the family's name. So that when you go into the marketplace, your father would pay for it simply by you putting the ink in your ring and putting the ink on the receipt that you picked it up. So when the father go pays his debt, because the Bible says God owes no man nothing. When the father go pay his debt, he see his own seal. I pay for it. He said, put the shoes because we travel some places that only, only God should know where we've been. To be honest, put some new shoes on him. Put some house shoes on him. Put some shoes that are going to be planted on his feet to remind him of his kingdom, to remind him of his value, to remind him of his worth. He said, let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For the beloved son of mine was dead. He was dead. My son was dead. My son had no contact with us. My son was far away, they didn't have no wife. I, I didn't know, nobody could tell me where he was. He was dead. In fact, when he left, he became dead to many people. But he's back, he's alive. But now he's alive again. Once he was lost, but now he is found and everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Now here, here's the last part. This is the oldest son. Remember Jesus is a good storyteller. He told you there was a man with two sons. We heard about the first son. First son went away, the younger son went away, the older son stayed, he also got his inheritance. We're going to hear about him in a second. Now the older son was out working in the field. When his brother returned, and as he approached the house, he heard the music of celebration. Why is he heard hearing the music? The father have a party. The father have a party. What are you going to do when your son lost and come home? You're going to celebrate. You're going to tell the block party, you're going to hire the best DJ, you're going to cook the best this, the best that, you're going to tell your wife bait and everything. Everybody gonna get ready. And he's hearing this music. He's like, what today is today not Friday? It paid it. I don't know what today is. And he's like, what? This is uncommon. What kind of celebration is this? So he called over one of the servants and asked, what's going on? Fill me in before I get close to my father because I've kind of missed out. The servant replied, it's your younger brother. He's returning home and your father is throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. Let me continue reading. I got no there, but let me continue reading. 
He became angry and refused to celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him. Hey, the grace of God is offensive. The love of God for you, it's offensive. The favor that God has given to you, it's not your problem. It's favor. It's offensive. It's offensive. Make people deal with it. The power of God in your life, it's offensive. The wisdom of God in your life, it's offensive. And some older brothers don't understand it. And they want to they, they want they want to understand it and they want justice and they want clarity and all the different stuff so who they must talk to the person that give you the favor the person that give you the wisdom the person that give you the love and the Bible says he stood out of the party you see when you're religious you can't you can't celebrate because you're striving for perfection when you're religious when you're an older brother mindset you're looking for perfection you're always self-inflicting yourself you're always wounding yourself you're always self-introspective and you're always thinking about how could you you know not measure up and all the different stuff because religion has to do with form and no power that's what religion is form and no power and this son now has power he has a robe he has a seal he got shoes he's restored he wanted to be a slave and his father refused for him to be a slave refused to be an employee you are a co-heir with me you come and enjoy this party let me deal with your, uh, your brother that don't understand what's going on here he says, he says son come on come and enjoy the feast with us so his father came out and, and pleaded with him come come and enjoy the feast with us the son said, Father, listen. I can justify my anger right here. Here's what he's saying. Father, listen. How many years? How many years have I been working like a slave for you? Performing every duty you've asked as a faithful son. And I've never once disobeyed you, but you never throw a party for me because of my faithfulness. He says, never once have you even given me a goat that I can feast on and celebrate with my friends, my homies, like he's doing right now. But look at this son of yours. He comes back after wasting your wealth and on prostitutes and reckless living. And here you are throwing a feast to celebrate for him. Here's the father response. My son, you always with me by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to celebrate like this and be overjoyed because his brother this brother of yours was once dead and gone but now he's alive and back with us again he was lost but now he's found let me highlight the couple notes and this is it finish get the song ready for me you know this 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 highlights these highlights the the heart of the older brother the father said to him son all this time you've been with me Everything that I have is yours. But the older brother was a slave to his duty. Was a slave, he wasn't a son. Everything he had was the father, the father given to him. Guys, I wanna, I wanna share this with you. We, can't, we, we, we have to stop working to be loved. This is what this young man problem was, the older brother. He was working for his father to be loved. He was working to be loved. Notice me, daddy. Daddy, notice me. Daddy, notice me. Please, please, notice me. Notice me, daddy. Daddy, daddy, please, please, please. Son, I notice you. When am I going to do this? Son, the fridge is empty. Son, this is all yours too. He never thought like that. He never thought like that. He was working to be loved instead of working from love. You see, wholeness, growth, maturity should always be celebrated. Maturity should always be celebrated. Growth should always be celebrated. But he cannot celebrate why? Because he's looking for perfection. And if you're looking for perfection in your life, there's not going to be a lot of joy in your life. But if you're looking for growth, if you're looking for maturity, if you're looking for wholeness, if you focus on the goodness of God that leads to repentance, there's going to be joy in your life. And joy has to do with the inner knowing that he's with you and he's never going to leave you and he's always for you. You know, for me, the main character in this story is the father. He's involved from the very beginning. He's the author and the finisher of the story. The father gives the son what he wants, when he wants it, and he blesses his son, and he leaves his son. But he never stops thinking about his son. He never stops interceding with his son. When his son comes home, he tells the whole neighborhood. He shamed himself. He protected his son. He clothed his son. He put the ring on his son. He put the shoes on his son. He embraced the son. You don't like it? I'm sorry, but my son is home. He talks to the older son. He's a mediator between the religious spirit and the grace that is available. Who did that for you? Jesus. 
Jesus, when people have a problem, you're just like, I'm the mediator between God and man. Let me talk with him. Let me deal with them. And he had to point out the religious minds that saying, hey, you are loved too, just as much as the son. Come and enjoy. Come and celebrate. Where's the love? He's working to be loved. Working to be loved instead of working from love.